In this video, we turn to the Kingdom of Judah, and I'm going to split this up into two videos. I realized the one for the Northern Kingdom was uh, a bit long. I think it was 40 minutes, and that's not good practice to do it like that. So I'm going to split this up into two as we talk about the Kingdom of Judah and ultimately the fall of the Southern Kingdom and the exile of Israel. The Kingdom of Judah itself, in comparison to the Northern Kingdom, was relatively unimportant. Uh, there wasn't much going on. They did have a trade route down to the south um, that they controlled from time to time, but they were all con consistently struggling with Edom for control over that. Not many people really cared about Jerusalem or about Judah. Jerusalem was primarily a religious center. Um, it was obviously during um, the, the, it's the, the heyday of Israel, it functioned administratively as well. But we actually find in the later days during the Assyrian Empire, they actually used uh, another city, Ramat Rachel, in order to manage all of the, um, the, the financial issues and the um, uh, town issues and all of this type of stuff. They actually managed that outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's major... Um, importance was as a religious center. It was also um, landlocked, as you can see. Let me just get my laser pointer. It's here, it's landlocked, which means there was no port. It had no access to the port, which limits trade. And worse than that, it had no as access to Philistia, uh, the towns of the Philistines. The Philistines remain a people at least up until the exile of um uh, the southern kingdom so they had they had the philistines to contend with they and the philistines had this piece of land here which was actually very precious because it controlled that via maris and we were going to find out that uh, this land comes under a great deal of it's 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 uh, it becomes part of a tug and a tug of war between assyria and egypt they all want this land here and they don't really care too much about judah up here at all so it's a landlocked territory um, that was um, relatively unknown. The leaders of Judah from the time of David, from the time of the division of the kingdom, when Jeroboam split the, uh, took off the northern tribes, and we have Rehoboam in the southern, in the south, they were all descendants of David, um, all the way down, even to the exile, even when puppet kings were inserted, they were always sons of David. So in that sense, they kind of like remained faithful to what God was doing. Jerusalem remains the capital, as I'd mentioned before, they don't move it. If you remember in the northern kingdom, it moved from Shechem up to uh, Samaria. It was King Omri who moved the capital up there. Jerusalem remains the, the capital of Judah pretty much, as far as the Israelites were concerned, or the Judeans were concerned, pretty much all the way down to the exile, which we'll talk about in a second. So um, I don't want to say go over too much of what happens with the northern um, kings, not too much. They have varying importance. We see names. It's always good to look at some of the length of their reigns. Um, some of them reigned much longer than others. Um, I want to get down to Hezekiah because he's the most important one for what we want to talk about, um, looking at the fall of the kingdom. There was also a queen. Um, if you look here, there's the name um, Atalia right here. Atalia, Atalia, I don't know how you pronounce it. But um, for five years, the southern kingdom was ruled, ruled by a queen. And she certainly, according to uh, a biblical perspective was um, had a wicked reign. She tried to kill off all of her possible successors uh, in order to grab hold of the reins uh, of um, leadership. So she was a queen here. The closing kings, you need to know, just down here, from the time we get to everything after Jehoahaz. So Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. These were basically puppet kings. Um, we read about them and it's, it's really interesting when you read just the biblical account and you find out about these stories and there's not much mention of 
the other forces of Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, or anything like that. But once you look at the other stories, uh, and you look at the historical landscape, it really gives you a better picture of what was going on and explain, explains some of the difficulties that you may have or answer some of the questions you may have concerning that. I'm going to go into that a little bit um, later on, in, either in this video or in the next. At the end, very similar to the Northern Kingdom, it was rebellion, failing to pay taxes. Uh, let that be a, a lesson to modern lesson. If you don't pay taxes, you end up getting exiled from your house, I guess. Uh, but it was the failure to pay taxes that actually led to the um, to the demise of Judah and the exile. And throughout all of these videos, I've left this date here, 587. It's 586, 587. That's the date of the final exile. On to King Hezekiah. We're going to look at him first. He reigned during the North's destruction. So, uh, the north was destroyed in 722, 721, and Hezekiah was living in the south. Uh, again, they're not totally detached. He would have known about what would have happened during the in the north. So he would have been at least partially afraid because um, he would have heard of the destruction that took place. And we know from the beginning of his reign, he was um, quite... Um, uh, supportive of the Assyrians like his father Ahaz was. We'll see how that changes though. He actually reformed religion. Biblically we know that um, and certainly at the beginning of his reign when they were um, part vassals of Assyria that he would have had time uh, to reform the religion to clear out a lot of the, um, no, not clear up, but certainly um, sort out Jerusalem, the, the temple, uh, and just bring some kind of religious reform into the area. He wasn't 100% sold on the Assyrian rule, I'll tell you that much. He actually changes his policy um, during his reign. Um, and as a result of that, Syria actually, Assyria actually comes and lays siege. Um, it destroys a lot of Judah at the time, it lays, it lays, um, lays a lot of that city waste, a lot of the area and a lot of the cities as well. Before that actually happened, um, he realized, he knew what he was doing wrong. He knew how he agitated the um, Assyrians. And so he was pre prepared for their invasion by strengthening and expanding the city. One of the things he does is he diverts the water supply. We'll see some pictures of that in just a moment. So that they, and he, he, the water supply originally was outside of the city. So he funneled it inside the city and blocked up the outside source so that all the water directly uh, supplied the city and them alone. We do have some evidence outside of the biblical record of Hezekiah. Um, there's this here, which is called um, the Hezekiah Bule. It's like a seal. And on it, it is written, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. So we do have external records of Hezekiah. We find this outside as well. Some of the northern kings, Pekka and Manasseh, uh, uh, sorry, and Hosea, sorry, Pekka and Hosea, we have records of them also in Assyrian records. So there is proof of these individuals. Sennacherib, it is Sennacherib um, III, if I'm not mistaken, who was actually king, uh, the Assyrian king, at the time of the reign of, or at least partially the time of the reign of Hezekiah. He's the son of Sargon, and they begin, oh, he's part of this Sargonic dynasty, which was very powerful and very influential in many ways, the heyday of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. He was, um, he was the person that Hezekiah dealt with most of the time. He moved his capital, which is one of the things, um, important things which he does. He moves the capital to a place called Nineveh. We know Nineveh from the story of Jonah. And he beautified it. He expanded it. He brought in 
Um, he, he made it much larger and images, oh, if you, you know, this is not the course for that. But if you look at, um, if you do a Syrian history and you look at images, you look at the size of Nineveh, it was massive. It was built over a couple of um, rivers. It was absolutely massive. It was a powerful, it was a fortified city. And many people thought that it was an indestructible city um, as well. In about 701, during the reign of Sennacherib, Egypt agitates the locals. So Egypt um, speaks to the, um, the Sidonians up north, up in the northwest uh, coast. Ashkelon and the Philistines, as well as Hezekiah, as well as some other regions as well. And what's going on with Egypt right here, this echoes back to what happened in the Battle of Karka, where, if you remember, we spoke about that, I spoke about that, I think, in the last video, where the northern kingdom, uh, under the rule of Ahab, joined with Arameans, joined with um, uh, a few Egyptians, joined with people, local peoples, and they, they ganged up together, and they were able to fend off Assyria. And that coalition, that the seeds of coalition, were deeply placed inside is, is in the hearts of the, a lot of the rulers. And so Egypt tries to get a coalition in 701 together against Assyria. So they try to do that and um, obviously it doesn't have great consequences because Sennacherib then invades the Levant. He invades the whole region in order to quell what was going on here. So he comes in, he defeats Ashkelon and the Philistines, and then he turns his attention to Judah. He comes and he, for, he, he Lachish is a fortified city uh, in Judah that defends the southern borders. It's a very big city, uh, probably bigger than Jerusalem, and it was a fort city, so there would have been soldiers there, uh, there would have been a standing army there, and they would have been like, like the last line of defense before anybody got to Jerusalem. So in a big battle, he defeats um, Lachish and raises it, and he makes his way all the way down to, all the way up to Jerusalem, and he lays a siege around Jerusalem. And at that particular time, there is um, a bit of a contrast or a conflict in what happens because according to Sennacherib, he talks about having Hezekiah captured like a bird in a cage um, and surrounding them. But a biblical account actually records of the angel of the Lord coming and smiting the Assyrian army and sending them away. So there's a bit of a mystery as to what exactly happened at that time. Um, according to the biblical record and external records, we know that Sennacherib actually died in 681 whilst praying to his god. Uh, I think it was Nisroch, and he's killed by two of his sons who then run away. This is an image very important, and it begins here, and it shows the size of Jerusalem. At the time of David, David conquered this little tiny, really tiny, Pitsky piece of Jerusalem here. And then it expands the darker area up onto the Temple Mount during the reign of Solomon. Now, about 150, a well, couple hundred years later, look what happens. It expands nearly four or fivefold during the reign of King Hezekiah. Why is this? Uh, well, the primary reason probably is that it was. Uh, not overtaken, but it was flooded with refugees. During the reign of Hezekiah, the northern kingdom was destroyed, raised, and many people were taken captive. But in this situation, many people would have seen, known of the Assyrians coming, and fled to Jerusalem for protection. And so many people came in from the north, and so Jerusalem expands greatly. I'll show you another picture of that. Um, later on. And then after the exile, once they come back from Babylon, it's back to what it was during the days of Solomon. So the population rises and shrinks as time goes on. This is an image of um, um, the, it's called the Lachish um, relief, uh, and it's the Assyrian depictions of the siege at Lachish. And I know that you've already chosen your topics 
for your research papers, but a great topic would have been the these reliefs. Just looking at them and seeing what we can learn about warfare, the siege engines um, coming against the city uh, to, uh, with the archers, types of warfare, what they used, what their armor looked like, what a fortified city looks like. All of these things we can learn um, just by looking at the images and the reliefs of um, uh, of this period um, from Assyria. This here is the what I was talking about before, the water supply, um, which was moved from here into the wards proper, and it was funneled. A tunnel was built. Hezekiah built a tunnel all the way down to here. This is the pool of Siloam. Um, that also appears in New Testament er eras. So the water goes there. They diverted the water there. This is a cross section of where it actually goes. Um, underneath the city, this was carved out by builders all the way through. And it was actually carved out with one building crew on this side and another building crew on this side. And they kept on going until they met in the middle. Now, they wouldn't have been working blind because you're obviously cutting through rock. So what they probably did was cut through, followed a natural fissure inside the rock and followed it through two teams working until they meet somewhere in the middle. And we know this because there is an inscription for that was picked up in the middle of this tunnel, which is known as the Siloam inscription. And this is a copy of that inscription. And it basically uh, speaks of the building of the tunnel. Uh, this is the story of the tunnel. The axes were against each other. And while three cubits were left to cut, the voice of a man called out to his counterpart, which is to say one of the crews dig in, called out to the other of the crews dig in, and they started shouting and cutting their way towards each other. And on the day of the tunnel being finished, the stone cutter struck each man towards his counterpart, axe against axe, and water flowed from the source, which is the Gihon Spring, to the pool. And this tunnel that was built by Hezekiah is still um, avail it's still available. It's still around today, uh, and you can actually walk in it as this individual is. And it's doing exactly what it did back then. It goes from the Gihon Spring underground for um, you know about it's about 20, 25 minute walk. That it does get high during the winter up to the waist, but you can walk all the way through. Um, a little bit scary, but definitely worthwhile. But it's still there today. Um, and there's evidence of Hezekiah um, it being built during his um, lifetime. This is what Jerusalem would have looked like. This area here was the um, city of David, just the city of David. I showed you some pictures of that earlier. Solomon expands it up to the Temple Mount. Um, this is the Temple Mount right here. And he builds it up there. And then Hezekiah, this is just an artist's impression. Obviously, nobody was around at the time. Uh, but Hezekiah built it this here. And he, what he, they built this in order to take in more inhabitants. Now, Hezekiah was also very much afraid of the king of Assyria. And so something else he did was he fortified these walls. And part of some of the walls we believe from Hezekiah's day is still visible. And it looks like this. And this is called the Broad Wall, and it's in Jerusalem. You can still see it today. You can't get in height. It wasn't this high because you, you look at that, you think, well, that's not going to stop a, you know, a, a chicken. Um, but the, the ground would have been much lower, and this would have been a much, much higher and thicker wall. And Hezekiah tore down houses uh, in order to build this wall just before the great siege of Jerusalem by Sennacherib. I'm going to stop there just to shorten these videos. And in the next section of this video, we're going to turn to look at Manasseh. And uh, we're going to go down. I think we should have time to go all the way down to the destruction of the southern kingdom.